Welcome to Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. Just before we get started, I have a big, some kind of a big announcement. This is our 450th episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, and I couldn't have asked for a better guest to come on and talk about himself, but also his community. And that is Iqaluit Mayor Kenny Bell. Mayor Bell, thank you so much for doing this. Welcome to the show, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. Thank you so much for the invite, and uh, you know, congratulations on a 450th <laughs> show. I didn't, I, you know, I'm surprised there too. So that's awesome. Well, Mayor Bell, I'm going to ask the exact same question I've asked every single politician who's come on this show. You're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh man, uh, you know, I, I was born and raised in 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 the Arctic, and um, uh, everything everything I have, everything that my life has um, has given me my three boys, my you know, even my ex wife, um, you know, uh, my whole life uh, has come from the Arctic, and um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I gave back as much as I possibly can, and I did, I you know, I ran originally in 2012 to 2015 as a counselor. Uh, and hated it, um, hated every moment of it. Actually, it was not a good experience. Uh, you know, I didn't like the the construct of council. I didn't like, um, you know, I didn't like I, I didn't like any of it. Not one part of it was uh, interesting. And I, I walked away in 2015 after my like, my council term was done. Uh, and then, you know, over the next four years, the next council and, and the next mayor, um, you know, uh, incited me into uh, running for mayor because I was I was I was really even more disappointed um, about what was going on. And, um, you know, I, I just you know, maybe I was wrong. Uh, may, maybe I was wrong about some of the stuff. Um, but at the same time, uh, I just thought we could do a better job. And, you know, I, I'm trying to prove that every single day. So uh, I'm just a hard worker. Um, you know, I didn't go to university. I, I went to some technical schools and, um, you know, I'm just uh, I'm just putting in hours to try to make sure our community is a better place to live uh, for, for, for me and my kids and, and our fellow citizens. And before we get into your community and how you're making it better and also the coming year, because you have an election in 2023, um, I want to continue on you. Who is Kenny Bell? Who is this person behind the mayor's chair? And I want to go back to what you said about giving back. And you chose to give back municipally, politically. You could have done that volunteer-wise. Was there a moment that there was a switch of the uh, uh, flip of the switch in your head that said, you know what, I can give back the best way municipally on the Iqaluit City Council. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, in, I'll tell you exactly what happened in, in 2012, 2011, uh, the city announced that they were uh, building a $40 million aquatic center. Um, uh, you know, our town is 8,000 people uh, currently. Uh, and we have a $40 million aquatic center. Um, it is built. I was the only councillor that voted no on every single vote uh, on that. I was the only councillor that ran uh, saying I was going to vote no on every single vote. Um, you know, and I got third in third in votes uh, to become a city councillor. Um, that was that was a that was really the what happened. And you know, the only reason I did that was because you know, uh, as a citizen, I'm I'm walking around, driving around, you know, t- partaking in you know um, hockey and other uh, municipal functions, and everything was dying. Everything. Our roads are in disarray. The city buildings are in disarray. The city vehicles are in disarray. Um, you know, and I, I was sitting there like, how? You know, yes, of course we need a we need a, a pool. But forty million dollars, um, this doesn't make any sense. And you know, so uh, that was my that was the defining moment. Um, you know, I realized uh, shortly after that I was uh, heavily outnumbered. And 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 tell you frankly, I mean, I don't know. Um, I probably asked more questions about the aquatic center in in one meeting on the aquatic center than anyone did in every other meeting going forward for the next two years. Um, it was basically a, a direct vote. Yes, I wanted a forty million dollar pool, and then the very next conversation would be for like a thirty four hundred dollar um, photocopier, and we'd argue for forty five minutes on where we're going to find the money. Municipal politics at its <laughs> best. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, you know, and I, and, I, and and you know, I mean, obviously, you know, the aquatic center. Don't get me wrong; it's a beautiful facility. I knew I would use it. I knew my kids would use it. Um, but it wasn't about that. It was back that you know, it's a uh, it's a four million dollar a year um, expenditure. It uh, you know, that's a lot of money for our small city, and uh, you know, it, and of course, it's um, you know, uh, you look at the you look at the stats, the census uh, it, it, at that time, twenty sixteen. Um, there was Nunavut as a whole was fifty six percent food insecure. Today, Nunavut seventy percent food insecure. Those the mass majority of those seventy percent of our citizens uh, across the territory are only worried about feeding themselves. They're not going to the aquatic center. You know, and uh, and all of those other functions that you know help we could have we could have fixed with forty million dollars. Uh, you know, are, are still in disarray. We will, I, the great thing about these conversations is you find out the struggles that communities have and that, that uh, statistic that you just dropped is kind of a bombshell and we're going to talk about it a little bit later if you don't mind, but politics is a uh, unique beast in itself, especially at the municipal level. The decisions that you make on a day-to-day basis affects the people that you go to school with, you go to work with, you, uh, your neighbors, your kids play sports with. The weight of municipal politics is a lot heavier, that I find, than provincial and federal. Walking in as a councillor for your city or as mayor in 2019 when you were elected, did you feel that weight of burden of making sure the money you spent, the votes you did were for the best of the entire community? Absolutely. You know, um, I, I, of course, I'm, I'm a, a privileged white man, middle-aged white man at that. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we represent mostly Inuit. Um, you know, th- these are my friends and neighbors that I've grown up with all my life. And, I, you know, I, I very often say I'm not here to speak on behalf of Inuit. I'm here to speak as a lifelong friend and neighbor. Um, and of course, I mean, this is, uh, this is the greatest privilege of my life uh, behind my, my three boys. Um, you know, the, I, this is my fourth greatest privilege in my entire life, and it will be forever, um, that I get, to, I get this opportunity to, to represent Inuit um, as, as the capital city of our territory. Um, it, but it is, it, is a, it is a huge weight. Um, it's a lot of stress, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm the type of guy, I, I really just don't care what people say about me. I don't care. I just, I've never cared. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know what it is. I just, I, you know, if I'm not going to go for a beer with you, I don't care what you're going to say about me. Um, but I do care immensely about my community, um, and the people in the community. And I want to make sure that, you know, we, we want to not just, you know, hanging on, which we, we have been for, for decades. Uh, but that we're thriving and we're moving forward in, in leaps and bounds where we should be because, um, you know, Nunavut is a territory of Canada. Um, it's, not a, it's not a province, it's a territory. They should be taking care of us um, until they give us our own wings and let us fly by ourselves. But uh, until then, um, you know, we shouldn't be uh, begging for money. We shouldn't be begging for infrastructure. Um, these are the types of things that they should be providing us to get us set on a solid footing. Uh, and move forward and um, you know we're just I mean of course we have don't get me wrong I have a really good uh, relationship with the Liberal government currently Um, you know I know you're from Alberta so I'm I'm assuming it's a conservative but um, me uh, in my my writing is a liberal writing I have the one liberal in Calgary who is elected yeah (laughs) yeah so yeah well you know and and it doesn't to me it doesn't matter you know at local like you said at local politics um you know, you're, you're one, we don't have parties here in, in Nunavut. The only, only person that's in the party here in Nunavut is our um, NDP MP. Uh, everyone else is, is standalone. The, the uh, territorial government is consensus government. Um, so, you know, none of us really go with the party. And I don't think you, you can at a municipal level. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, there's just so much going on that you, you need to be uh, very flexible in, in your, you know, your political biases. Does, does that help your community? Does that help your community when you have an independent slate, uh, both provincially and municipally? Because 
in Alberta or Saskatchewan or any other province besides uh, the, uh, the Northwest Territories, Yukon does have a provincial party system, but uh, the Nunavut and the Northwest Territories are both consensus governments territorial-wise. Does that help your community in some sense? Because you're not going to a conservative MP, you're not going to a conservative MLA, you're going to John down the street who knows the exact issues that I have and he's not looking at it with a partisan lens. Yeah, you know what? I, I, there's two sides of every stone, of course, right? And, um, you know, it is, it, is, uh, it is fairly good, um, you know, but really, I mean, you know, if you, you say you have your parties, they, they have specific goals they're they're moving forward on those goals, um, yeah. You know, and, and it's hard to tell Nunavut right now because, although of course all of us have goals, we're hanging on by a thread. Our our infrastructure is dying around us. Um, you know, we we there's there's not one part of our infrastructure that is that is golden. Uh, there's hardly any solid ground for us to step on to push up on and, and keep on moving. Um, so it's hard to tell whether those goals are going because we're always reacting to emergencies across the entire territory. Um, so it's, um, you know, I, I think in like, you know, maybe 20 years, we'll know if it's a really good system or not. Um, <laughs> it's one of those hard, hard uh, questions to answer because, um, you know, we're just, we, we have constantly been reacting to emergencies and it's really hard to judge how any, anyone's doing politically when, um, you know, you're just, you're just constantly moving that way. You, I'm, I'm already fascinated with this conversation. We're only 10 minutes into it already. And this, this line of questioning that I'm going to, about to go on was not prepared. It's not, it's just out of what uh, Mayor Bell has said. You are saying that you're, the people of your community, your territory are struggling right now. That is shocking because we Canadians pride ourselves on being one of the most uh, financially soluble countries in the world we have a vast wealth of uh resources that we can help our fellow canadians but you're saying that's not happening up here we're, we're kind of being forgotten is that right yeah well I'll, I'll i'll say it like this um look inuit are the most hardy group in the world uh living in the arctic conditions and thriving in the arctic conditions is uh, for for millennia is uh a task that is uh you know no small feat um, it is a hard way of life up here, uh, but it's also an amazing life. So don't, don't uh, you know, I, of course, there's some disparaging things going on, but it's still also uh, such an amazing place. Um, you know, we, um, we're, we're probably about 20 years in infrastructure behind the NWT. The NWT is probably 10 to 20 years behind the rest of Canada um, in infrastructure. We, we have uh, 25 communities. 39,000 people in the biggest land mass in Canada with zero, zero connection to the rest of Canada. The only way into any of our communities by, is by air or by boat and eight to nine months of the year, boat is out of the picture. So you're only by air. Uh, of course, it's an extremely expensive way to uh, bring in goods, bring in passengers, you know, bring in uh, anything that you need to bring in. Um, and also, uh, you know, every, every one of our communities is a standalone community. So every community has a power plant. Every community has an uh, airport, a health center, uh, schools, um, you know, water infrastructure, sewage treatment plants, uh, and, and landfills. Um, of course, all of those things, if you look at any city in the world, all of those things are extremely expensive to operate. But not only are they extremely expensive to operate, you have to have staff that are able to function to work them. Now, uh, if you look at Canada as a whole right now, even the world really, um, you know, the human deficit that has come from this pandemic. Um, and and I don't know if it's from, from the pandemic or people just kind of were like, I'm retiring or whatever is happening. Um, but is, that is a real, real concern across all of Canada. And even more so here because, you know, we, most of our uh, workers um, are imports. Because we only have thirty nine thousand people, so well, how do uh, how do you huge, fix that? Uh, how do you get people to consider Iqaluit or even Nunavut the, to the territory to come in and set up shop in your community? When, let's be honest, it, by the sounds of it, it's expensive to live there. 
Sure. Um, you know, in, in 1979, my parents moved uh, from New Brunswick to uh, Inuvik NWT uh, for a one-year contract. The one-year contract was three times the amount my dad would have made in any job in the Southern Canada. You know, it was great, uh, you know, especially coming right out of university. He, he graduated university and, and, and went up there, um, you know, and, and ultimately I was born there and we stayed uh, all of our lives. Um, you know, my, my, my uh, parents are now retired and, and have both moved down south separately. Um, but at, at that time, it was three times the amount. You know, now, uh, you know, you could basically make the same amount down south, especially because of the shortages. Um, so a lot of people, uh, you know, in the especially the construction fields, um, you know, that have been saying, you know what, I haven't been home for 20 years in summertime, but I can make the same amount I'm making up there, plus I'm at home. So I'm, why, you know, why would I come up? So, um, you know, unless you have like a, you know, you want to, you want to go on a, a real adventure, um, you know, and I, and I say this quite often, um, the city, Calvert, is an adventure. Um, we are not like any other city in the world. We have no street lights. We don't have any, you know, most of our streets are still unpaved. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I know, saw your tweet today as of recording this yes. at the planning committee tonight as of recording. You're looking at installing those street lights. Yeah, by 2030. And I was like, wow, this is getting futuristic. <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> it's um, yeah, listen, we drive our four wheelers and, and skidoos on our roads. Um, we're, we are a real Arctic city. Um, you know, we, we're, we, we're a small village. Listen, we're 8000 people. Um, we're only uh, a city because we're the capital of our territory, um, you know, but, but, uh, you know, we have, we have all of those problems. We have a capital city problem. Um, you know, all of the functions from the government are here, you know, the jails, the, you know, uh, everything's here. So we have, we, we have a big issues, but, um, you know, small, small compared to any other real city, um, you know, in, the, in, in Southern Canada, but it's, uh, yeah, we're, you know, of course, am I excited about the lights? I don't, I actually don't know yet. Um, I'm like, I don't, I don't really know if I like that idea. Well, kind of futuristic, like you're, <laughs> but who knows? Um, we, we could talk about this subject for a long time and I am cautious of time. So I want to make sure I get all my questions here. Well, hello, this is your friendly host of the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. I have some big news for you. I am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with strategic steps incorporated to launch a brand new show on October 19th. The political trenches local government at work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments, and we will have a roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the news show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into the political trenches. I want to talk about your community over the last two years. You were elected in 2019 as mayor of the, the great city of Iqaluit. And literally a few months later, the global pandemic happened. So you are now navigating a unknown that you probably did not expect to have to navigate. Then in 2021, the city has a massive water crisis. You get hit while you're down in some sense because travel is not happening. People aren't coming to your community. How has the city of Iqaluit survived the last few years? Yeah, it, you see me take a big breath there. Um, Did you sleep uh, at all? God, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, this this was crazy. I like I knew my term was going to be crazy because I'm a polarizing individual. Um, you know, I, I say I say it the way it is, or the way I think it is. Uh, whether that be wrong or right is is up to the interpretation. But um, I am who I am, and and uh, you know that's one of the good things about me because I do sleep relatively good at nighttime um, because I know what I, I what I give back. I you know I work hard, um, I put my hours in, and um, you know, but uh, but <laughs> but always a but. Um, absolutely insanity uh 
it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any sense to any of us. Um, we're just trying to do the best for our communities, you know, and we have anti-vaxxers just like everywhere else. We're, we don't have, um, you know, the, the, the Freedom Convoy never made it here, of course, because there's no roads. Um, uh, yeah, darn, I, I really missed out on that one. But, um, but no, you know, I mean, yeah. And then, and then, of course, we had this uh, the, the craziest water crisis that you can imagine. There's literally oil in our water. You know, it doesn't make it doesn't like it doesn't make any sense. Um, Did they ever find out you know, what and, happened and, there? I apologize to interrupt. It's just yeah, I, I, it kind of happened, and then the news kind of stopped talking about it, and there was no like follow up of what's going on. And since I have you here, is there a solution or yeah, was there right, a, absolutely there was. There, yeah, no, there was there was a there was a tank that was buried, um, an oil tank, a diesel tank, um, buried uh, in I think it, I think 1995. It could have been earlier, but I I think that's it was when it was built, buried, and it, they they for whatever reason uh, they cemented over the top of it. They put four or five feet of uh, land land on it, uh, and then put stairs over. And um, you know that that tank ultimately uh, failed. The the bottom of the tank got eaten through for I guess from years of you know neglect and and whatnot. And the 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 um, diesel was sitting in the uh, groundwater, moving up and down as the groundwater went up and in and and ate through our cement um, that was uh, in our water tank. And um, you know, it was ultimately in that water tank. So, um, you know, the good thing about that whole, the whole thing, I mean, there's not, there's nothing good about that. Um, but the good thing about it is that no one was being poisoned. There was not one point outside of the tank, outside of the treatment center that, that came back outside of Canadian uh, drinking standards, um, which is also a crazy story. The Canadian uh, limit for uh, oil in your water is 390 micrograms in your water. Uh, but but you can smell it at fifty micrograms. So like I, I mean it's, that, it's I don't know it doesn't make any sense to me either. And you're um, saying that the you know, Canadian government said that the drinking water was okay because it was under that three hundred and ninety milligrams of oil in the water. Well, I don't know if that's okay, but it's safe. <laughs> it's, oh, it's not. It's, it's obviously not. You are good. a politician, um, Mayor. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, I always say I'm not, but you know, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, you know, I, I don't understand some of these things. You know, I'm just, I'm, you know, you asked me who I was. I, I'm, I am a kid from a small town uh, on, on a big stage right now. Uh, and especially during this water crisis um, and this, and this COVID things, uh, these are, these are things that I would never thought I would ever be doing. Uh, you know, I was on Al Jazeera TV. I was on BBC TV. I was on, you know, almost every Ottawa radio station, uh, you know, in power and politics and all of these things. And, um, you know, and for negative things, um, you know, none of that was, none of that was fun for me. And, you know, and I, it probably raised my profile a bit and, um, maybe why you, you know, you, you followed me on Twitter and, and here we are today. Um, I don't know, but, um, you know, the, Listen, I, I wanted to make change for our city in, in a positive way. And right away, we're hit with negative after negative. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it has been really challenging. Um, we're still getting a lot of really good things done. Um, you know, we're, we're, the city is building housing for the first time in history. Um, you know, um, we're, we're, we've, we got $214 million from the federal government to fix our water supply issue that's been, uh, you know, uh, six years running. Um, you know, we're, we're doing, we're doing huge things and, um, we're collecting back taxes, uh, our, our old water. We're doing all of these things that we should be doing as a city, um, to make sure that our city can function properly, uh, as well as, you know, human things. Uh, for example, we're paying for funerals now. Uh, the city is paying for funerals because our, the large majority of our citizens can't afford it. Um, you know, and so there's that human touch as well. So, you know, there's a lot of things to be proud of and uh, there's a there's a great future ahead of us. Um, but yeah, of course it was, it, you know, the, the last couple of years has been trying on all of our citizens and um, no more than our, our workers uh, that who also live here. Um, you know, it's been, it, it has been a, a real hard time. And I, I, I like to transition away from the what's happened to what's going to happen because oh. We always, I want to try to always put a positive spin on this, uh, on communities. And you have one year left of your first term. I, we're not, I'm not going to ask you if you're going to seek re-election because it's a year out, but I'm going to ask you 
what's on the chopping block for you as mayor to get accomplished within the next year? If you walked away on October 23rd, 2023 and say, you know what? I'm done. I had a good first term. I'm good with everything I've accomplished. What would you want to get accomplished in the next year? You know, uh, Chris, I, I could walk away today and be proud of what we've done. Um, you know, I, I, there's, I mean, there's still so much work to be done in in Nicaragua and in the territory. Um, but I think we're all in a better place right now. Um, you know, we 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 forged relationships with the federal government and our Inuit organizations that had never existed before, uh, the territorial and federal government. Um, you know, and like I said, we got the 214 million dollars to fix our long-term water supply crisis. Um, you know, that that stuff is well on its way. Uh, it's going to be about a four-year project, so that's you know the next the next mayor will will get that accolade, and I'm I'm more than happy to give it on. I just want to make sure that we we have water for the long term. Um, you know, we're we're working on plans for um, you know 20-year plans for to do our our roads uh, to fix our roads to pave them, uh, upgrade them, uh, fix and pave. Uh, you know, we're we're these are things that uh, we're going through. Really, um, it, you know, if I could focus on one thing right now, uh, you know, it's it's, it's definitely housing. Um, you know, we we've, we've got the money for the water fix. We're 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 happy with that. Um, Nunavut as a whole is about 5,000 units short in housing um, for, for our 39,000 people. Uh, is, you know, we have people that are living you know, 17, 18 deep in a three bedroom house. And uh, we, we really need to push. There's also you know, people making 120, $130,000 a year sleeping on people's couches because there's just no housing available. Um, so I wanna make sure that we get, uh, we get housing under control and, and on a good track. I started a, a affordable ta um, a mayor's task force on affordable housing um, a year ago. We, we produce our plan. Very proud of that. Um, you know, we like I said, uh, we're building housing for the first time in the history of of, of the city, uh, and that's a five way partnership with the government of Canada, the government of Nunavut, and two Inuit owned um, corporations. Um, one a builder and one a, a technical uh, for us and the city. So it's the first time in history it's ever happened. Uh, that was a huge step for us. Are you looking at single dwelling housings or are you looking at a, wath, a swath of different types of housing, whether it be apartment buildings, whether it be uh, townhouses, what type of housing are you looking for? Or are you just happy that any housing is actually being built right now? Because at the end of the day, that's the first step. Yeah, uh, you know, I, this, is a, this is a hard hard question to answer too. Of course, we need everything on the housing continuum. We need we need uh, you know affordable low low income uh, market value uh, personal purchases. We need everything condos, uh, but we're just happy when something's built. Um, you know we're we're so, we're in such a um, you know deficit that it's a, it, you know it's an emergency. We need to get these things uh, built as fast as possible. Um, and you know and like I said, we're building eighteen uh, units um, right now. Uh, which isn't a lot, but we've also, uh, so it's uh, $10.7 million. It's $600,000 each, um, which is you know, still pretty high for a multiplex, uh, but we are in the Arctic and, and things do cost a lot. Uh, typically before COVID, the government in Nunavut was building at 750,000 per unit. And shortly after our announcement came out, they had uh, just canceled two different projects because um, they came back at uh, just over a million dollars per unit. Um, and they were like, well, how, how is the city doing 600,000 and we're getting quoted a million? And it was because we did a sole source contract with an Inuit development firm owned by Inuit for Inuit. Um, you know, the, the profits go awesome. back to Inuit. So that's why we, we did this sole source contract with them. Um, you know, and, the, and with the blessing of the Canadian government, um, CHMC, that gave us the funding uh, through the Rapid Housing Initiative. And, um, you know, so we're, we're very proud of that. I mean, is, is that the answer to everything? No, I, I don't believe so either. Um, you know, you can't just always do a source source contract, but um, in this case, we, we saved, you know, $400,000 per unit uh, in today's market. And, you know, that's something we should be all very proud of. I'm almost going with my light here. Um, Pause here for two seconds. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, difficulties with these, uh, you know, power restricting lights. Um, but no, you know, I mean, yeah, I, we're just right now. We, we any anything that we can do to move forward is is a is a good bonus for us.
One of the big things that uh, Canadians are facing from coast to coast to coast right now is affordability. And inflation is being on the top of a lot of people's minds right now. Now, I, I will be the first to admit, I've tried to go to Nunavut a few hundred times, but the cost to get there is astronomical. And I was doing some research before we recorded this, and I was looking at the cost of groceries in your community. And while I complain all the time when I go to the grocery store, I, I realize now that I have no right to complain because the cost of groceries, the cost of living in your community is much higher and the affordability issue is much more prevalent in your community even before this, uh, the talks that the politicians are doing federally. How, how are the people of, uh, how, how are city council trying to address the affordability issue in your community? Because it must be a conversation that has to happen every time that the council meets, isn't it? Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's it, we don't really. And I'll tell you the reason why. Um, the government of Nunavut is, is um, you know, historically responsible for almost everything that happens here in the territory. Um, they fund the 24 other communities, um, but they also are the biggest purchaser of airline tickets and cargo um, services. So they basically set the price. Um, and we only have one airline. Um, you know, the, of course, there's Nutritious North. I'm, I'm not sure if you heard that, but it's a federal government um, uh, program that helps pay for cargo um, on, on uh, healthy -ish, um, products. But it, yeah, I mean, that's why we have seven, you know, we're in the territory as a whole, the territory is 70% food insecure. And that's obviously number one reason. Um, you know, if you look at the Baffin section, which is uh, where Calloway lies, um, we have uh, a shortage of, of um, local food. We, have, we, we don't have uh, very many caribou. There's a, um, you know, there's been a, a ban on a, a tag system for many years now. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues going on um, that are making it so bad. Um, but of course, you know, it's, it's you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of our businesses, say, for example, uh, North Mart, which is our, our main uh, grocer. Um, they're, they're a fairly large grocer. They, they have 300 and some stores across the Arctic and, and some Caribbean nations. Um, so they, 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 do, they have the purchasing power. Just, I mean, not like Loblaws would, but probably not that much different. Um, but they have to house their workers. They have to feed their workers. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, they fly them in and out, uh, you know, especially their senior managers, uh, they would be flying them in and out uh, quite often because there's, there's um, a lack of available bodies here. Um, so, you know, they have, you know, they, for example, here in the Calvary, they have, uh, you know, 20 units that they house staff in. Um, you know, so of course your, your costs are going to go up. Not only that, we're, we're still powered by diesel uh, generators. Uh, so our, our, our power is fairly expensive. Um, and of course you have all your fridges and, and lights and whatnot in your store. It, it, it costs a lot to do business here. Um, you know, of, of course we, we need to move on um, some sort of uh, renewable uh, energy, but at the same time, um, the government of Nunavut is responsible for that. Yeah. Um, you know, is there anything the know, city can do though? Is there anything that the city can do or help out? Because we, we talk about prices of energy, prices of water, and that's a city issue. Water is a city issue. So you could lower prices that way to give them some relief. But is there anything that the city can do or has done to help potentially attract these businesses to their commu your community as well? Yeah, so, you know, I'll, say, I'll start with the water, right? Of course, our, our water bills are, are extremely high. Um, and one of the one of the reasons is is that uh, I don't know 20, 25 years ago the government of Nunavut started giving the city uh, one point two million dollars for water infrastructure every year, which isn't a lot of money, but you know twenty years ago it was pretty good. Um, and you know of course you you would build on that and at least give you some down payments and and whatnot to move and fix certain things. At the time, the council uh, decided to give that back as a subsidy. 
so they they were giving everyone uh, 1.2 million dollars in total for the city government uh the city uh you know commercial properties uh this this infrastructure money back as a subsidy and in 2011 or 2010 um you know when when there started everyone started realizing oh we're having this uh, impending water crisis coming and asking the government of Nunavut for funding the government of Nunavut was like well what, what's been happening with this 1.2 million dollars we've been giving you for the last 10 years and so I can imagine that didn't go back. for well yeah absolutely you know and um it's terrible, right? I mean, everyone was so used to having really cheap water and now it's really expensive with no service upgrade. And actually the, the services got worse. Um, you know, we had that amazing, uh, uh, you know, the water emergency where we, we couldn't drink from our tap for almost two months. Um, you know, and you st we, we, we forgave those two months, um, but it cost us about $900,000 a month to provide water to our citizens. Um, you know, uh, it's, that's way too much. Uh, and you know uh, how do we how do we figure that out? I mean, we're going to make a big step here when we start when we start with that 214 million dollar um, uh, influx from from the government of Canada because we're going to replace one third of our piping, which of course is old and has a lot of water main breaks, so uh, it will cost us less to produce water because we won't be losing so much. Um, you know, so it, it, we'll start doing certain things here that will that will help, but. Um, it, and at the end of the day, it's still uh, how do you how do you recover for that cost and provide a good service um, when everything is just so much more expensive? So, it has it been challenging to figure that out because I've talked to many municipal councillors and mayors like yourself across this great country for this segment of the series of episodes we're putting together for the show, and I've always asked them the question about doing what's right for the community against doing what is right for say john and bob who live on street x who want their road paved because they believe that is their most pressing issue right now for a small town like yours who is seeing an infrastructure crisis and i say crisis with all due respect because you are aging out of that infrastructure is it hard to balance the needs of the individual residents against the individual the the town or the city as a whole uh, absolutely you know i have this i have a wonderful citizen um, that comes in probably uh, every month or so um, and sits down and have a coffee with me and, and you know shares her concerns about m many things um you know she's been here 40 some years in, in in the city or in the arctic and um you know the other day she was here and she said you know that one of the main things that happening in the city right now is bike thefts and the city's really got to do something and i was like you know god love you but i i don't care about bike thefts right now like i mean it's it's not good. My kid's bike was stolen last week, but um, like we have, we, we, we have homeless people there, you know, our homeless shelter is, is turning away, you know, 60 people a week. Um, you know, we have a, a, a damp shelter that's turning away, you know, 12 people a night. We, you know, we have uh, power issues. We have uh, no, our water issues are, are, are staggering. Uh, we have no housing. Uh, all of these things we need to even just live, uh, uh, you know, a, um, a decent life. Um, are, are missing, um, you know, and, and, and of course, do I care about the bikes being stolen? Of course I do. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we only have so many things we can do um, in, in a day. And right now we're just holding on for dear life, uh, trying to keep our head above water. Um, I shouldn't say water, maybe sewage. Um, we should, you know, try to keep our head above our sewage um, uh, while we fix the water and, and housing situations to, to be able to, um, you know, have pride in the place that you live. Um, one of our, one of our, our, our I've seen as a, as a mayor, so I've been here my entire life. Um, we used to have a, a, a beautiful community, uh, like, you know, uh, cultural, um, musical, uh, you know, just everyday life was, you know, hey, how's it going on the street? Now um, it's completely different. We have so many transient people um which which is not bad it's just we haven't been able to engage them because there's always so many problems so we're trying to rebuild the community spirit so that the people that are transients you know hey i love this place i really like it i want to live here like my parents did in 79 um and so many other people did over the years and um you know so uh, so I, actually i can't remember the last time that the city has done anything for christmas 
not, like no lights up, no, like we don't have trees here. So there's no big Christmas tree that gets put up or, or anything like that. But um, so we're, you know, we started last year, we're, we started, we started a, a Christmas festival. Uh, we were putting up Christmas lights this year. I mean, uh, we were in the middle of a water crisis last year, kind of um, screwed up a lot of stuff, but um, you know, this year we'll, we, we'll, we'll be, uh, you know, uh, we'll be doing Christmas lights across the city. Um, you know, all just little things um, that, that have some, some positive impact on people's lives and hopefully that they, you know, start buying into the city and, and wanting to be here uh, and not just be here for the money, but be here for the community um, and, and, and enjoy their life. Uh, ultimately, we want everyone to enjoy their life. And, you know, and, and if you're coming here just for the money, um, if you're going anywhere just for the money, if you're going to Toronto just for the money, you're going to hate Toronto. If you go, you know, it doesn't matter. You go to Mexico just for the money. You're going to hate Mexico. Uh, you need to, you need to buy into the culture. You need to uh, meet people and, and uh, you know, take part in uh, the outdoors, especially here. This is an outdoor nation. Um, and once you do that, you, you really will fall in love with this place. Um, and, and once more people fall in love with this place, there'll be more care and, and it'll be easier to provide services uh, for everybody because you're not just trying to pick and choose for the right person or, or the person that is the loudest um you know uh, loudest person on the block through that I, I i and i just saw that we're at the 40 minute mark and i want to turn to the last segment and that's the wrap-up part of the, uh, the show and th these are kind of fun questions we we talked about the nitty uh, gritty stuff but i want to talk about the fun questions here and that is you're a bit of a, you're a little bit more about your community but from your perspective and that the, the first question i have for you is what makes the city of akalawit so unique in your opinion Oh man, you know this place is uh, this place is amazing. Uh, you know, I can I can wake up. You can wake up at you know eight fifteen, have a shower, drop your kids off at daycare, and still make it to work by eight thirty. You know, the, like how how can you be mad at that? Um, you know, sometimes I, I drive my skidoo to to work, uh, and you know after our meetings, you know it might be a frustrating meeting. I jump on that skidoo and I'm on the land in in ten minutes. Um, you know, with and I can you can skidoo pretty much anywhere you want because there's no trees. Um, so you know, the middle of winter is it's it's just snow, so you can just go and go and go and have no real care, uh, and you instantly just forget about all the all of the problems. Um, but also uh, the culture, um, the culture that's that is here uh, that is celebrated here is amazing. Um, you know, the hunting spirit, uh, you know, the the hardy spirit of of, of Inuit that have lived here for millennia. Um, are all things that, you know, you just have to admire and, uh, you know, I'm lucky to be a part of, uh, I'm, I've, you know, I've been lucky to live here my entire life. I, I, and again, that's exactly why I'm trying to give back, but, you know, ultimately I, I, I hope the next mayor, uh, whether I run or not, uh, is in anyway, I, 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 I honestly believe that I, I believe that this capital city should have, um, an Inuit mayor, um, you know, there wasn't a new mayor and I ran against them, uh, that wasn't. That was for multiple reasons, um, but I, but I do hope that somebody uh, good will will stand out and uh, and you know happily uh, I can happily walk away uh, and just go back to my regular life and not have to worry about um, you know political the political world anymore. I'm not. I don't want to be a politician. Uh, I just want. I just thought we could we could be providing better services. Next question is this, and I I, I saw a tweet recently from you, and this is where this question kind of spawned from. If I was a tourist coming to your community tomorrow, if I was planning a visit to the city of Iqaluit tomorrow in the territory of Nunavut, what, what, what are the main things I should be doing if I was there? Or what should a tourist do when they're in your community? Oh, I mean, I want to buy art. Um, you know, we have, a, we, have a, we have a large art, um, you know, where, they, where the capital city, and of course, uh, a lot of artists live here. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very artsy town. Um, you know, if you go to the, you go to uh, supper at one of our restaurants, whether it's a fancy one or or a non fancy one, uh, there's somebody usually walking by your table trying to sell you, um, you know, a carving or um, or beadwork or 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 drawings, uh, you know, uh, prints. So it's it's a pretty amazing place like that. Um, you gotta get on the land. Um, you know, the city is just you know it's just like any town. Right, you know, we got roads and buildings, and and you know how interesting is that? Um, but you get on the land, you, you leave this, you leave the last road in the city, and you're on the land in in literally uh, two minutes. Um, 
and you know the the hills here we're very mountainous well i guess hilly not mountainous because you know we're nowhere near the mountains of of alberta but um you know it's 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 a uh, it's a rough terrain uh, but it's really good for hiking for skiing um you know boating for the summertime if you get on the boat you can you know very easily see whales um seals uh sometimes polar bears um so seeing wildlife is a is a big thing um uh, dog teaming people should go dog teaming um you know if you're here during winter you can do igloo building um you know uh, the northern lights uh you know who doesn't love the northern lights um you know a lot of places in canada have the northern lights but we have um you know spectacular northern lights because we don't have that much light pollution um so you know th those are the some of the the main big things that i think that uh, everyone would you know absolutely love if they if they came and what's your favorite part of the city what's your favorite part of the city is it getting out on the land is it actually getting out and just relaxing on that ski snowmobile yeah. or is there is there a little park or is there a little spot that you take your kids and just enjoy a little downtime in your community yeah for sure I, you know i have a i have a cabin um not too far out of the city and um you know I, we we spend a lot of time there uh, but also, um, you know, a lot of friends have uh, cabins down the bay and, and you know, go boating and, and skidooing. But uh, I'll tell you, my favorite part um, is the unforgiving nature uh, of people that live here. Um, it doesn't, you know, you, you might think that you had the worst day or you did the, you, you made a bad decision or, um, you know, uh, for example, I don't know if you saw on the news, but I, I got into, I got, I got assaulted at the store and of course I fought back and that was some negative news. Um, but the mass majority of our citizens were like, yes, thank you for helping me out. You know, like they're so sick of people causing problems at the stores that they were happy that it happened. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, I did say that. I just didn't um, want to bring it up. I let my guests bring up their altercations. Yeah. No, you know what I mean? Was that a good experience? No, absolutely not. You know what I mean? It was scary. Um, you know, I had my three little boys and, and, and my girlfriend's little, little girl with her and um it, with me and um you know it wasn't fun um you know but at the same time i mean you're not you know you can't just let someone at attack you if, if someone attacks you you're, that's a good way of you know one getting getting knocked out or, or worse um but anyways you know i mean this wasn't a good experience but at the same time um you know most people i mean i got a, a letter from our elder society you know thanking me for standing up for people um, you know, you're sitting there like this isn't. I don't understand it, but people people here are really forgiving, um, especially when you know you, you just like, you acknowledge, hey, this is the, this happened, uh, it sucks, but here we, here we are, and um, you know people are are great. So I, I you know I would just say our you know our community is is my favorite part, of course. Uh, you know we still need to build on that and try to draw in some of our our transients, but um, the people that are from here and that are here. Um, are just the most amazing people on earth. And, um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up my life uh, for anything. Well, I appreciate your candor, your honesty over the last 50 minutes, uh, Mayor Bell. Um, I appreciate everything you've done and uh, uh, taking time out of your busy day to do this. So thank you so much. Yeah, of course. You know, thank you so much, Chris. I, you know, I follow you on Twitter, and uh, you know, I was, uh, I was wondering if you were ever going to ask me because you know we interact every once in a while. So now I'm, I'm, this is great, and thank you so much. I, I knew I had to keep you for 450th episode. So there we are. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Month Long Series. Uh, as I say during all my interviews at the end of them, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody It helps our society and helps our democracy and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.